Welcome, everybody. This is Tiny ML Talk. Um, I am Carl Fieser. This is the first time I've done this one. So, hey, everybody. Uh, I want to take a moment and thank all of our sponsors. And we have Arm, who's a strategic partner, Deep Light, Edge Impulse, Maxim Integrated, Kikso, Reality AI, and Sinsense. Um, the next Tiny ML talk is going to be Tuesday, December 22nd, and that's going to be John Edwards, and he will be talking about low MIPS and memory machine learning for industrial vibration monitoring solution, aka not all applications, not all AI applications are cat versus dogs on Facebook. I would like to introduce Ian Campbell from On Scale. Uh, Ian Campbell uh, has went to Georgia Tech. He has an MBA and an MSAE. He founded Next Input in 2012. Uh, it's an award-winning MEMS startup, raised over 30 million in venture capital funding. Uh, and he founded OnScale in 2017. Uh, it's a cloud engineering simulation, digital proto prototyping of M MEMS backed by Intel Capital and Google Gradient Ventures. Uh, and with that, I'll leave it to you, Ian. When uh, people ask me what OnScale is, I like to tell them, we are building Tony Stark's Jarvis. And if you don't know who Tony Stark is, shame on you because as an engineer, he should be your favorite Avengers character. He doesn't have any inherent superpowers. His superpower is his ability to engineer cool stuff like his Iron Man suit. And he built Jarvis, which is a supercomputer powered by AI that understands multi-physics uh, to help him design and engineer his his stuff. Uh, at OnScale, we took inspiration from that. OnScale is a cloud multi-physics multi platform powered by artificial intelligence. We've taken powerful, proven multi-physics solvers, things that describe the physical world, like uh, thermal analysis, mechanical analysis, electrical, etc. We've taken those solvers, we've made them massively scalable on cloud supercomputers brought to us by our partners, AWS and GCP, Google Cloud. And we've built our own AI machine learning engine to manage this solution. And we also are enabling our customers to take advantage of AI and machine learning for use cases like using simulated data to train embedded AI. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Most of our engineering customers use on scale for traditional engineering design and optimization. So you see an example here where we start with uh, a 3D CAD model. This CAD model was created in Onshape, which is the world's best uh, cloud CAD solution, very similar to uh, SolidWorks on a desktop or Creo. Uh, with that 3D model, we can import it into our on scale. Uh, interface and we can set up simulations. We can simulate fluid flow and mechanical physics and thermal physics, everything that you would do to optimize this device, whatever it is. Uh, there's a scripting language that underpins all aspects of on scale simulations. There's a means to post process results to actually visualize results or use our scripting language to do things like use simulation results to train artificial intelligence. Uh, in engineering and R&D workflows, this process is used to just find a winning design, you know, figure out what, what the best configuration is of geometry and materials, material properties to achieve some engineering goal. Uh, what we're really excited about is what we call sim AI. That's the combination of simulated data and artificial intelligence. This is really a game changing capability uh, to be able to use artificial intelligence in a range of different use cases. The example that I'm gonna tell you, tell you about today is very germane to TinyML's mission, which is to you know, get embedded AI uh, easily and efficiently and quickly. And with simulated data, uh, we, can, we can reduce a lot of the workload of getting uh, data sets for AI. As we all know, AI needs a ton of data to be uh, effective. And there's two ways to get data. The old fashioned way is to put together a prototype, 
or prototypes, many different prototypes. Put those prototypes on test fixtures or in environmental test chambers or out in the field, go grab a bunch of data sets over time and then use that data to train your AI. The new way is just to simulate all of that. If you have a, a simulation platform that can simulate the physics that would occur on that uh, device or system, uh, you can replace a lot of the physical prototyping, physical testing, physical data collection with simulated data, and you can get robust AI algorithms much faster using this technique. So the technique starts with simulation. First, we'll simulate all of the different types of physics that will occur on a system. We'll collect the simulated data sets. We'll then use those simulated data sets to train artificial intelligence, in this case for an embedded application. We can also test the algorithms. Uh, we can do that without even having any physical hardware. Again, we can just use uh, simulation methods to test whether the algorithms are performant or not. If the algorithms are not performant, we'll just simply simulate more. More, more cases, uh, you know, more aspects of the physical universe to make those algorithms work. If the algorithms are performant, we can then embed them on our physical prototypes or, or on our finished products. And then once we have products that are out in the field collecting physical data, we can start to sprinkle in physical data into the uh, AI training set so that over time we can replace the, the simulated data with physical data or augment the, the simulated data with physical data. That's something that we call a digital twin feedback loop. And we're actually doing this today with some of our uh, smartphone customers. And I come from uh, kind of the smartphone world or at least putting MEMS sensors into smartphones. So this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, at Next Input, we use the old fashioned approach of building prototypes, collecting physical data, and you know, trying to create algorithms to make our uh, 3D touch and force touch systems robust. And let me tell you, that is a painful approach. And if we had had something like this, uh, we could have saved a lot, of, a lot of time and effort and risk. But let's take a, an example case study. Let's go back in time and pretend we're at Next Input and we're developing the first 3D touch solutions for smartphones. And the objective is we want to use force sensors, four force sensors underneath a touch display uh, to measure touch locations and then calculate 3D touch points, X, Y, and F, or force of multiple touch points using just those four force sensors. Uh, we've got a number of patents on that at Next Input, in including uh, one with the inimitable Steve Naziri, founder of InventSense. And you know, we lived and breathed this. We, we did this for real, and we used uh, the old-fashioned physical approach to collect our data sets in order to create algorithms. The complicated part about the algorithm is the algorithm is nonlinear and it's over-constrained. If you've got four inputs and you're solving for three outputs, you got an over, over constrained mathematical problem. And uh, you know, we, we actually worked this out alge algebraically and it gets very messy. Uh, and then developing those uh, algorithms the old way, uh, it was risky, it was time consuming and expensive. So let me tell you about the new way of doing this. Uh, our team at OnScale, we took that same problem. We created a, a 3D CAD model in Onshape we parameterize the touch inputs. Within Onshape, it's a parametric CAD solution. So you can create parametric CAD and you can have an array of faces on which you can apply a force. So that's what we did. We parameterized the touch inputs on that touch screen. Uh, in this case, we used uh, 45 touch points across the touch screen. And then we brought that parametric CAD into Onscale and we executed all 45 simulations in parallel on the cloud using a cloud supercomputer. So let me show you what that looked like. First, we'll, we'll bring in our 3D CAD model from Onshape. Onshape and our, our integration with Onshape makes it very easy to import different CAD and, and different CAD configurations. So there's the 45 positions of our touch point. 
we'll import the CAD. Meanwhile, OnScale will begin to attempt to set up the simulation study for us. So we're, OnScale is analyzing this simulation and trying to figure out the best way to solve uh, this mechanical simulation in this case, but this could easily, easily be a thermal simulation, an electrical simulation, a fluid simulation, whatever. So we'll apply a force that's going to represent a human touching this touch screen. We'll apply a fixture to the edge of the glass, exactly how these pieces of glass are constrained inside of a smartphone. I'm going to put some restraints to, to uh, represent the different force sensors, four force sensors in this case. And then we have a fully constrained simulation, so we're ready to start running simulations. The nice thing about OnScale is we've got an automatic mesh and estimation engine. So instead of me trying to figure out what the correct mesh should look like, we're going to do that automatically. And OnScale will also estimate how long this will take and how how many core hours it's going to cost me uh, to actually execute these uh, 45 simulations. So there we go. I got an estimate. It's going to take you know, 21 seconds per simulation. We'll run all 45 of them in parallel on the cloud. Now I've sped this up a little bit, but not much. And just in the interest of time, I'll skip ahead. But you can see that the simulations are executing and we're starting to get some results back. This is generating gigabytes worth of data. We're going to leave all that data up on the cloud and we're going to do all of our post processing in the cloud as well. So I can actually cycle through all 45 simulation results when they're ready. And I can look at things like displacement, stress, or what I'm interested in. I'm most interested in the reaction forces at those sensors because the reaction forces at those sensors are going to become my inputs for my uh, AI algorithm. We've also got a embedded Jupyter notebook. And this is where things get really interesting because with this Jupyter notebook, I can get access to all of the simulation data. So you can see all 45 simulation results there. I can create Python scripts to manage that data and put it in a format where I could send the data to TensorFlow or SageMaker or whoever my AI, preferred AI solution is. So now that we've got our, uh, in this case, 45 simulation results, what does that look like? Uh, you can actually see the reaction forces from each sensor. There's one in the top left, one in the top right, bottom left, bottom right of the uh, touch screen. And you can see that we have a very nonlinear force response surface from those 45 touch points. Uh, what we'll do next is we'll actually start training uh, AI algorithms based on a very large data set. So I showed you uh, 45 simulations. We actually ran 8,000 simulations. We randomized the, the 3D touch points. So randomized the X, Y, and F location of those touch points. And then we looked at the reaction forces at those four sensors to create the inputs and outputs of our AI algorithm. We then trained a shallow regression network we use one network for each variable. So there's one network for X, one network for Y, and one network for F. Uh, we used six hidden layers. You can see the, the architecture of the, the AI algorithm here. Uh, we used Bayesian regular, regularization and backpropagation. Uh, we used the validation scores to terminate training. Uh, we split up our, our set into uh, this was 70% training, 15% validation, and 15% testing. By the way, we did all of this, we completed all of these simulations in a matter of hours. Whereas, you know, if we were executing these simulations in serial on a desktop computer, for example, it would have taken days or weeks. And then if we were trying to collect physical data to do this same AI training step, uh, it, it could have easily taken months to get the physical data set. So here are the results for those three networks, X, Y, and Z, or F. And then here's how well our uh, AI predicted touch points 
from our validation and test cases. So as you can see, it does a pretty good job of detecting you know, where a human is touching and then also detecting the, <laughs> the force. Let's take a look at a more complicated case where we have uh, eight sensors. In this case, this is way over constrained. So now you have eight, eight inputs for three outputs. And this is actually a multi-touch case. So you could have, um, you have up to 30 outputs for, for 10 touch points. So this becomes very complicated. This is the type of algorithm that, you know, would be very difficult to derive mathematically, but it's an algorithm that's really well suited for artificial intelligence. So in this case, we ran through the same, same process, did a bunch of simulations, created our AI data set, trained the AI algorithm, and then we actually simulated the physics of the problem by actually putting in uh, touch points randomly. And then we use our AI algorithm to predict the location of those touch points. So here you can see the sensor uh, data and then the AI algorithm doing its thing and predicting uh, the location and, and the force of a touch. So as you can see, it does a very good job. By the way, we did all of this without ever building a single prototype. This was all done with a simulated model and the AI algorithm that we trained on simulated data sets. So what are the takeaways? Takeaways are using simulation in AI or what we call sim AI. Engineers can create embedded algorithms that actually work in hours, not days, weeks, or months using physical data sets. Physical data sets are always gonna be important. You know, there's only so much that you can actually simulate, but if you can get uh, a robust algorithm that's, you know, pretty high accuracy, low error using simulated data and then feed in physical data later and save a ton of time and cost, that's the approach you should take. OnScale is the only simulation platform that has a scalability to run large simulation studies like this in order to collect very large data sets to train AI. Uh, next steps for us, we're going to be publishing some further white papers and case studies and, and hopefully doing more uh, webinars like this one. And we're going to talk about how this same approach can be used for calibration of a sensor system or compensation of a, of a sensor system. Uh, even down to you know, individual units that can be calibrated because there's manufacturing tolerances, there's variance in uh, geometry and material properties for every physical system. And if you can account for that, you can calibrate it and compensate it uh, for those variances using AI. We also want to create robust algorithms, algorithms that are not sensitive to external noise like thermal and vibration. In the uh, example that I showed you, we neglected those things, but we could very easily also simulate uh, noise. You can inject noise uh, into your simulations and uh, make sure that your AI algorithms are robust against that noise, whether it's thermal vibration or, or some other noise source. So that's, that's pretty interesting. And then finally, we wanna uh, publish some studies on this digital twin feedback loop where you actually have a physical device that's collecting data out in the field and you're feeding back the physical data and filtering it in with your uh, simulation data. And then coming very soon, we're going to enable the ability to <clears throat> both execute sims and train AI algorithms all from that Jupyter Notebook interface. Some of the careful uh, watchers of this webinar may have noted that we switched to MATLAB for the, um, the training portion. Uh, very soon, we'll be able to do that all from a Jupyter Notebook on a web interface. And uh, that becomes a nice, tightly integrated, very automated uh, workflow. Um, further afield, uh, we, we're dedicated to expanding our SimAI capabilities as a company. Today, we use SimAI in our estimator. So you guys, you, you saw how we were able to look at a a simulation setup and estimate how long the simulation will take and how many core hours it will cost us. Core hours is like our digital currency to run simulations on demand. We've trained an AI machine learning algorithm 
on over a million simulations, I mean, different sizes, different finite element, uh, orders of magnitude, different degrees of freedom, I should say. And um, we can very accurately predict the runtime, the core hours, the RAM that would be necessary to execute those simulations. And that's nice because we're actually able to create custom supercomputers for each individual simulation study and use our computational resources uh, very efficiently on the cloud. In 2021, we're gonna be doing more design space exploration. This is something that we call Explorer, where you have a bunch of simulation data uh, and you know, you've, you have a sort of in-dimensional uh, design space and you wanna explore that design space, but you don't wanna run a simulation for every possible point or permutation in that design space. Instead, you can run a subset of simulations and then use uh, AI algorithms to interpolate within that design space. In 2022, we wanna start bringing in guided engineering. So looking at previous simulations that you have, have run, so be you know, your simulation studies, and then we'll recommend um, you know, different uh, simulation setup parameters so that you always get the simulation results that you expect, the accuracy that you, you expect. And we start eliminating what we call GIGO or garbage in, garbage out, which is a huge problem with uh, multi-physics simulation. Uh, in 2023, this is getting a little bit farther out in the future, but we also, we wanna bring in some unsupervised engineering, meaning an engineer can just put in a 3D model and some design constraints and then say, I want you, the supercomputer and the AI, I want you to optimize this design for me. Uh, and then that leads us to, this is kind of a joke at the end, but you know, we'll, we'll, we will either arrive at something uh, like Jarvis, where you can talk to your supercomputer and have, him, uh, have it uh, create Iron Man suits for you, or potentially we develop Skynet and Skynet takes over the world. This is my shameless plug for OnScale Solve, our new product. Uh, we have a promotion going on right now. If you're interested in uh, what I just showed you, uh, you can get it at a pretty significant discount if you sign up before uh, December 31st, basically a 60% discount. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, follow us on the various social media channels, and we'll have a lot more uh, AI and sim AI, AI topics that will be very relevant for the tiny ML community. Thanks a lot for your attention. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Ian. That was, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, we do have a lot of questions in the Q&A. Um, let's see, I saw one that came in first. Oh, this is a good one since you just plugged it. James asked, do you do academic and educational discounts? Yes, yes we do. There you go, James. <laughs> Um, Ilya, I think at the first question, is it correct to say that you use a surrogate modeling approach? Yeah, you could call this a surrogate modeling approach. That's what we called it when I was at Georgia Tech using simulated data to train AI. Um, I don't know if anybody calls it surrogate modeling anymore, but um, sure. Uh, and then can you go a little bit more into detail about SimAI? Uh, Sinyade asked, what is the typical system requirements for running SimAI hardware, memory storage, et cetera? Can SimAI be used directly on an embedded device? So kind of clarify SimAI for what its purpose is, because it seems that seems like, because it's meant to just design these models, not run them on the device, right? Yeah, SimAI will produce the AI algorithm that you can then program onto an embedded AI chip. Uh, Wei Wen is about to show you some really cool uh, hardware approaches and, and ASIC approaches for running uh, custom AI algorithms and actually customizing the ASIC to match the AI algorithm. So you could use OnScale, for example, to create the AI algorithm using simulation data with SimAI. And then once you've got your algorithm, you can use uh, Wei Wen's approach to actually generate the uh, hardware, the, the ASIC, the transistors that that algorithm will run on. What is SimAI exporting exactly? Is it is it like a TensorFlow light model or is it something, do you have a, like a, a different engine you run in? 
it, it, you can pick any AI engine you want. Uh, we we use the MATLAB's toolbox, so it outputs you know a MATLAB formatted uh, uh, CNN. Great. Uh, let's see. Rohit asked, uh, tiny ML data sets typically have small footprints and require basic machines like laptops for training. How do you see on scale being used on tiny ML applications? That's, that's kind of following along with the, the first question. You know, in order to train the AI, training the AI using simulated data sets or, or any data sets is a computationally intensive uh, you know, step. So that's why things like SageMaker and TensorFlow exist. You can train an AI using a cloud supercomputer. And then once the AI algorithm is trained, you can then embed that on a hyper-efficient embedded ASIC, for example, that doesn't require you know, supercomputing capability to do the prediction that you want to do. So you know, we, we do everything up until the point where you've got your AI algorithm, and then, you know, there's many other options to actually embed that AI algorithm uh, onto a, an embedded system using Maxim integrated chips, for example, or Waywinds chips. Yeah, great. Um, let's see, another question. What sensor modalities does OnScale support? Was, does OnScale's approach support? I'm sorry. What sensor modalities does OnScale's approach is, what sensor, sorry. What <laughs> sensor modalities is the on-scale approach? What is it capable of simulating? We simulate physics. So, you know, every sensor has some sensing modality that leverages some physics. What I showed you was a, a force sensor. So it's measuring force, obviously. Uh, those force sensors were piezo-resistive MEMS devices. Um, OnScale doesn't care that it's a piezo resistant MEMS device. OnScale will just give you the reaction force that'll go into that sensor. And then you can have a, your, your sensor model to transduce force into some of the output. Um, but we've, we've used this approach for things like uh, piezoelectric devices, uh, micro machines, ultrasonic trans transducers, MUTs. Um, it could be used for uh, temperature sensors, it could be used for gas sensors. Uh, pretty much anything that uh, is sensing a physical universe, which is what sensors do, you can mod model and simulate that using multi-physics. Excellent. I think we have time for one more question. So, uh, let's say... Um, have you have you guys tried? This is from Venkatesh. Uh, have you guys tried a single model to calculate x, y, f coordinates rather than separate model for estimating each of them? Is there any specific reasons to go for separate models for each of the parameters? That, that's a good. Uh, it's a great question. And yeah, our first approach was just to have one AI network or or one CNN that um, calculates x, y, and f together. Uh, there are some advantages to separating those out. And in fact, there, there would be some advantages to having uh, committees of CNNs for multi-touch applications. So a committee would work like this. You've got kind of a hierarchy. The, the first neural network will determine if there is one or more touch points. The next neural network will determine, you know, kind of generally wh where those touch points are. And then a third layer of neural networks could then determine uh, X, Y, and F uh, more accurately than have you tried to, to program one neural network to do all of that logic. If you split up the logical steps, sometimes you can get neural networks that are uh, more efficient and more accurate. Great. Um, yeah, that's a really good tip. Like, Generally, when you throw everything into one network, it ended up getting bigger and bigger and bigger and slower. And so and less accurate. So splitting them off and doing consensus is great. Uh, I think that's all we have time for today. So thank you so much, Ian. Uh, if you have any other questions for Ian, feel free to reach out. His email's right there. Um, and definitely check out OnScale. And if you're interested in it, now it seems like a good time to buy. It's basically like a Black Friday deal. Yeah. I think our sponsors, uh, Arm who is, is 
great uh, software and hardware foundation for TinyML, uh, focusing on both software and hardware optimized for edge devices. Um, DeepLight, uh, we use AI to make other AI faster, smaller, other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Uh, TinyML for all developers with Edge Impulse. Go ahead and get a free account at edgeimpulse.com. Uh, Maxim Integrated, the new Max 78000 implements AI infer in inferences at over 100x lower energy than other embedded options. Now the Edge can see in here like never before. Uh, Kikso AutoML for Embedded AI, automated machine learning platform that builds tiny ML solutions for the Edge using sensor data. Reality AI is for building products. Uh, SynSense, SynSense builds ultra low power sub milliwatt sensing and inference hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. We design systems for real time, always on smart sensing for audio, vision, IMUs, biosignals, and more. Uh, don't forget our next TinyML talk. It's going to be the last of the year, uh, December, Tuesday, December 22nd, John Edwards, and uh, he will be talking about low MIPS and memory machine learning industrial vibration monitoring solution, aka not all AI applications are cat versus dogs on Facebook. And that will be at 8 a.m. Pacific time. And thanks again, everyone. <laughs>